with Liberty Me, here with uh, Jason Lee Bias. Uh, if you, if any of you watched any of the old Liberty Minded classic videos, you'll recognize him. And he has a new publication out, uh, of which he is the co-creator and editor, uh, The New Leveler. And The New Leveler, uh, which uh, the subheading is An Arrow Against All Tyrants, is uh, a new publication from the S4SS, Students for a Stateless Society, which of course is the student organization wing of the Center for a Stateless Society, the left market anarchist uh, think tank. Jason, thanks so much for being here. I'm glad to see you all as always. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about the uh, the new leveler. Uh, who were the levelers? You your first essay here gives a nice little historical account. Tell the viewers who were the levelers and um, uh, where did the uh, title come from here? Right, the levelers. A lot of times people will try to say so who was the first major libertarian movement. Um, one answer that often gets provided is the levelers. Uh, the levelers were a 17th century group in England. They originally fought with Cromwell against the king in the English Civil War, um, but then once it was clear that, that having a Lord Protector was a whole lot different than having a king, they're also against Cromwell, and so they spent a lot of their time in prison, a lot of their time in exile, things like that. Um, some of them got executed, but um, and the, the subheading there, as you mentioned, is an arrow against all tyrants, and that's because Probably the major uh, leveler pamphlet that gets remembered is where remembered as an arrow against all tyrants. The full title was something more like uh, an arrow against all tyrants shot from the prison of Newgate again into the prerogative bowels of the House of Lords. Um, and the reason we picked this was this is the name is because the levelers um, I think represent not just a, an early libertarian movement but a libertarian movement that understood the radical nature of what, um, what supporting, as they called, uh, freeborn rights, such as, once again, as they called, uh, self-propriety, uh, what that really entails and what is the real mission of l looking for a free society. So they didn't like the term levelers, though, right. or at least they didn't use it all the time. Why didn't they like the term, and why do you adapt the term? Right. The reason they didn't like the term, then the, they, when they did refer to themselves as levelers, they said the levelers so-called, they preferred the term agitators, which I also like, but I, um, the reason they didn't like the term levelers was because they thought that it implied they wanted to lower everyone down to the same level, which, of course, as individualists, they didn't want to reduce everyone down to the same level. But I do think that there's an important sense in which they were levelers and an important sense which libertarians ought to be levelers as well. And that's that uh, when you have a society of, for instance, they oppose the titles of nobility, where the, where, and I mean, we still have that to some degree, even though it's not official, um, because uh, what that does is it creates a separate legal status for particular individuals. Such in, in, our, in our current day, we have cops, the president, the congressman, who can do all sorts of things that you and I can't do. Uh, and I think the important lesson for libertarians to remember is that we want to level away all those, those, those sorts of things that tower over us. And also, uh, I think uh, we can see that the society that has the state is the sort of society that also is going to create uh, its imitators in the in the private sphere, and I think sure. that's one another thing that sure. So you you speaking of that, you've got a litany here of mm -hmm. grievances, kind of, yes. uh, and and you go through the basic kinds of grievances that libertarians have with the state, mm -hmm. but you also include uh, non uh, public education and the workplace, right. things that libertarians or just individuals might think of as in the private sphere. Uh, why do you think that those are deserving of your ire or your criticism? And uh, yeah, why, why do they belong in here? Right. One of the things <clears throat> I say in there is, the, uh, is I say that we have all these sorts of worthwhile goals like education, defense, uh, having productive fulfillment, using our talents towards productive fulfillment. Um, and those are twisted against us as institutions that don't serve us, but instead serve themselves. And one of the things I say there, like you mentioned, is I say the state schools and their imitators. And the reason I say the state schools and their imitators, and not just the state schools, is because I think a lot of the times, the, um, given the, la the lack of competition in an education, the competition that does exist just kind of fits to a, roughly the same sort of uh, model as we see in the state schools. And I think that's a problematic model. Because that model, one of the things it does is it teaches us to equate obedience and, and achievement. 
we we learn that uh, that that turning our assignments in on time and things like that that the reason that that's important is not doing doing good things but we have to follow what um, those in authority tell us to do and that that is how we're graded and similarly um, we look to the workplace and it's not it's not uh, while it while it is a, uh, a situation where people are mutual it's a mutually beneficial arrangement it's not always easy to, to realize that because often it's it's similarly structured to the way we look at society in general as situations of domination. And one of the things I make sure to point out there is that I think that much of this is due to the fact that it's acting outside with this it's acting with this backdrop of state of state aggression. Uh, for example, on the on the on the workplace example, I talk about how. Uh, we have these existing labor laws that make it impossible to have, uh, well, not impossible, but much more difficult to have some more serious unions that rewards those unions that are most bureaucratic and compromising. Sure, sure. And you say that individual, individualist anarchism is the word for wanting out. Yes. So what, why use the words individualist anarchist, uh, harking, harkening back to those original anarchists instead of uh, other descriptors? Right. So, like I just kind of, we already kind of touched on this because one of the reasons I, I mean, as you mentioned, this is from the Students for a Stateless Society, which is related to the Center for Stateless Society, who I also write for. Um, one of the reasons we don't use the term anarcho-capitalist is because we think capitalism is best used to describe the sort of managerial, uh, the managerial workplace that we see today. And I don't think that there's any reason, one, to believe that that sort of thing is the sort of thing that can survive in a free mar market. And I also don't believe that uh, the sort of person who considers themselves an individualist, as most libertarians do, uh, should want to see that kind of arrangement succeed in a free market. Uh, but the reason I like individualist anarchism so much, rather than all the other litany of descriptors we could choose, so I think it summarizes basically the idea that we're trying to get at, which is we want to empower individuals um, to, to, to fully realize their own potential. Um, so that's why I chose that word. Sure, sure. Sounds great. Thanks so much, Jason. Thank you.